Hare Krishna, Yogesh Pro, humble obeisances. Welcome back to the Monks Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. So, Pro, today I thought we could discuss on a topic that is both of spiritual relevance and also your, I think, material specialization. So that is the Holocaust. So you could talk about the Holocaust, human nature, and uh, Gita wisdom. So from what I have read, that it is one of the events that scarred the modern psyche very severely. And it's even today, any severe, any event that is very severely destructive, it is often the Holocaust is the standard comparison with which it is, it is used. So can you tell me about uh, say how you got involved in the research and what your thoughts are on the subject broadly? Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm called upon to address gatherings of lawyers and judges and law professors um, to uh, present uh, information about my research into war crimes trials at the end of World War II, the uh, value of the testimony of eyewitnesses, principles of justice that took place at Nuremberg and other military commissions, as they were called at the time. And um, very often, uh, a question arises that I anticipate, namely, uh, you're a spiritual person, you're involved with yoga and meditation and so on. How in in your mind, do you reconcile the idea of a benign and beneficent supreme being, purposeful creation, with the horrors that took place in Europe 78 years ago? How do you put those two things together in the same worldview? And it's a very legitimate question. And for the longest time, I was unable to answer that question. You know, to say something as, as insensitive as, well, people get what they deserve. Oh. You know, if six million Jews and other uh, minorities uh, were tortured, starved, um, dehumanized, and, 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 and murdered in concentration camps, they got what they deserved. That was their karma. That's a rather cold, heartless, callous assessment. Uh, and it certainly is nothing that would attract anybody to explore Krishna consciousness. Yes, definitely. Uh, so, Prabhu, and, just uh, one step backward, if you don't mind. Yes. Don't mind. Yes. So, you said you are called upon to at such forums. So, is that because you you have studied this subject and you studied it because of your artistic interest, because you have made some books and documentaries about it, or how how did you become involved in the subject first of all? I know you are from a Jewish background, so naturally there is some connection there. But how did you get specifically interested in this field? Well, initially, my involvement with uh, Holocaust studies came through uh, my wife's late father. Um, I married after coming back to America after 13 years of living in temples and ashrams. And uh, met someone we fell in love and married. Her late father was a, a, a very well regarded philanthropist, uh, educated man who, among the many worthy causes that he supported, endowed what is called the Fortune Off Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies at Yale University. It's the, uh, it was when it began in the 1970s, the largest and still today the oldest collection of video recordings of survivors of the Holocaust, liberation soldiers, bystanders, perpetrators, religionists, uh, and other witnesses to the Holocaust. And uh, at the time, I was a children's filmmaker and the uh, taking children's books and making animated films from them for the Disney Channel and for public television and so on. So the people at the Yale Archive needed my help. They were confronting uh, uh, an emergency, namely that the early years of these videos had begun to deteriorate. You know, at the time, you go back 50 years, 
um, video of choice was called three quarter inch umatic video. And it's not like digital technology today. It was these strips of magnetic videotape. Uh, people may be familiar with using VHS videos in their video player from years ago, mm. um, but the, it was a very unstable base. So the archive needed help raising money to transfer their early years of video testimony to a more stable format because the tapes were deteriorating. So along with other people, I volunteered to help raise some money. And they found out that I was making children's films. And they said, well, why don't you make a movie from our testimonies of Holocaust survivors, and if you can get it on television, maybe people will send money to help us continue our work of recording survivors. So that, that was kind of my first entry into Holocaust studies, and from there I went on to <clears throat> earn a degree uh, at uh, Hofstra University, and as you mentioned, write some books and do some documentary films. Mm. So it was more like a something, it was a volunteer work which eventually evolved in a professional interest. Something like that? Or yes. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. It, it did evolve into a personal and professional interest um, because of what I started to mention that people yeah. were always asking me, well, you're involved in Krishna consciousness. How do you reconcile this beautiful vision of a, a universe where souls evolve to become uh, reawakened to their love for God and you know, go back to God. How do you put that vision together in the same worldview with what people are capable yeah. of doing to one another? You know, how do you put that together with uh, years of torture and, 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 and murdering children and, and babies and, starving people and performing uh, horrible, inhuman, um, so-called medical experiments on them without uh, um, any uh, uh, anesthesia and, uh, you know, the cruelty, the depth and scale of the Holocaust was a challenge to our very definition of human nature. How is it possible for people to fall to such depths of depravity how is that even in our nature? And it is, for many people, a cause of atheism. Yes. You know, uh, the, the Holocaust scholar and Nobel laureate, uh, the late um, author Eli Wiesel, used to say, he was a survivor of Auschwitz. He said the Holocaust could not have happened with God, but it could not have happened without God. And for him, it was a, a challenge to his faith as a believing Jew and he was not alone. What many people? The second thing that it could not have happened without God means what? God was used as a rationalization by both sides. Not a blade of grass moves without the will of the Lord. Oh, okay. Humanity has no agency outside God's will. Nothing happens that God does not allow to happen. No. So if either this this is of course the great problem of of um, theodicy. You know, yeah. the reconciliation of evil in the world. How do we simultaneously believe that there is a benign and beneficent supreme being, and yet we see such depravity and evil at the same time? Mm -hmm. Either God is all good, but he's not all powerful because evil has some authority outside his control, or God is all powerful. He can control events, but he's not all good because he allows things like the Holocaust to take place. That's called theodicy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So just uh, one step back before we explore the philosophical question. Human history throughout has witnessed a lot of brutality. Anytime when, say, one king, one king has exp expansionist agenda and they attack and then destroy other kingdoms, so if we consider the Arabic expansion of India, that has also led to a lot of scars. And now the word Holocaust is used, is attempted to be used at other places also, although it does not become mainstream. So, I, so the reason, if I understand right, why the Holocaust itself has become such a, such a prominent symbol of depravity is because it was done so systematically, so scientifically, so 
so you could say so um so targetedly against a particular ethnic group it's among the history of because in india somehow many of my viewers are indians and the holocaust has affected i see the european and the american psyche much more the indian than the indian psyche so why does it stand out so much as a symbol of human depravity if we consider uh in the communist violence against uh, their own citizens estimates are that 100 million people were killed uh, but so is it that this happened in a very short while in a very syst systematic scientific and ideologically justified way or what is your understanding of this I mean, well, so the word holocaust during the 1940s the word holocaust did not exist uh, okay and the word genocide the term was introduced by Henry Lumpkin, who um, went to the, to the Greek uh, the, the word in Greek means uh, a, a sacrifice by fire. Hmm. And um, so the, the word came to uh, symbolize the, the uh, as you said, the systematic state-sponsored, also we might add scientifically designed murder of European Jewry by the Nazi party and its allies. Since then, over the course of the last half century or more, there's a tendency to universalize the term to refer to uh, many different kinds of genocide, the Native American genocide, the Armenian genocide, the, as you say, in the Soviet Union, and the Stalinist genocide. Uh, and there's a kind of um, what some scholars in the field uh, sarcastically call Holocaust envy, you know, that our suffering is, is as great as your suffering. But that, that's a... That's a uh, we, we don't need to get into that too deeply. The word in its strict sense refers to the fate of European Jews under uh, the years of Nazi yes. rule. And we know today from the evidence that if Hitler had won the war, he would not have stopped with European Jewry. His plans were to eliminate every Jew on the face of the planet. So there is a particular place. Yeah, and eventually it might not even be Jews alone, because he had also targeted of course not. gypsies, also targeted yes. physically, of course, yes. handicapped, mentally yep. deficient people also. Yeah. Well, ma many groups were targeted for persecution. Only the Jews were targeted for total annihilation. Okay. Yeah. So, and, uh, yes, please. Yeah, so you're saying that because it was state sponsored, because it was so scientific, so scientifically executed, and it was also very systematically targeted. And of course, it was, I think, if, if you consider, say, the Soviet uh, persecution, it was distributed over 70, 80 years, whatever happened. Whereas this was in five years in a very. I think, I think so. Yeah. Well, what more? Uh, accurately, the first concentration camp, uh, uh, Dachau, uh, opened in 1933. So you have about 12 years of um, okay. uh, operation of the camps. Okay. And uh, of course, it was after uh, Germany declared war in 1940 that you have uh, the escalation of the destruction of the Jews in killing, <coughs> killing centers. Okay. <clears throat> there were thousands of concentration camps. They weren't all killing centers. Killing centers were opened uh, starting in the 40s. Okay. But uh, I think just to, if I may, bridge the gap between our defining of the Holocaust and our interest here in this conversation today. Um, on the one hand, there's the question of how can uh, um, a God-centered creation um, allow room for such horror that that's one issue that deserves to be addressed if if we are going to um, deepen our understanding of Krishna consciousness I think these issues need to be confronted um, <clears throat> I find it tragic when I meet some some devotees I'm not saying it's how widespread I have no idea but there are 
the devotees who will argue, you know, from that strict karmic sense, people get what they deserve and so on. Um, I think we need to step back a little bit from our own theological um, perspective. It may be that there is this an interesting term, this uh, karmic architecture, this background architecture yes. to creation, where the the immediacy of our lives, the events that we can observe, the experiences that we have in the moment, have remote causes in history, going back previous lives, you know, karmic reaction. But we can't access those previous lives. There's, there's no going back in time. There's no value in hoping for a better past. Yeah. So what we can access is this life, this life that we're living now. And so I think it's critically important that we understand that the more valuable and the more important and the more humane expression of Krishna consciousness is not to say people get what they deserve, but to reach out when we see people and who are suffering and extend a hand of devotional compassion. Yes. Paradukka dukki. This is so true. I found that uh, karma is... Uh, I, have, I haven't seen anywhere in scripture when somebody is suffering, somebody else comes and tells them it is your own karma. They might say, the person who is suffering might say that, I don't know what I had done in the past because of which I am suffering, or I had done something in the past. But nobody uses that to, you could say, the make the sufferer feel worse or anything like that. So, so that is, I think it's a, it's a, not only an insensitive use of philosophy, but I also feel that it is not a very traditional way of doing things. It, I, I haven't seen any basis in scripture when somebody is faced with suffering to tell them that it is their karma because of which you are suffering. So when Abhimanyu is killed in the Mahabharata, well, it, 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 when Abhimanyu is killed in the Mahabharata, Krishna doesn't tell Arjuna it was Abhimanyu's karma. Krishna actually, what you said exactly, how to move forward, how to face the situation. So Krishna basically says to him that, you know, because Arjuna is angry with his brothers for failing to protect his son. So Krishna says, you know, Arjuna, distress comes upon everyone in this world. Uh, the difference between the wise and the ignorant is that the wise act in a way to decrease distress and the ignorant act in ways that increases distress. So your brothers are as distressed as you are. Don't speak words that will increase their distress. So when I, I also used to use the karma philosophy in my early years, but then I realized that it, it, it doesn't help in any way at all. We might get the satisfaction that we gave an answer, but as far as helping somebody, to make sense of their situation and to get some wisdom to move forward, it doesn't at all help. So I fully agree with what you're saying. And I didn't address, I think of it in this term so much, that instead of focusing on the past we can't access, we can see how our spirituality can provide people the resources to face the present and the future. That is a much more empowering focus. Yes, it is. Um, but it's not sufficient. We have to go deeper still. Yes. Because a thinking person will immediately ask, well, all right, that's very nice that uh, as devotees you're extending a hand of compassion. But it's God's ball game. Why did he have to make the rules so stringent? In other words, it's like the 11th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. It's every reason anyone could want to, to be an atheist. When you look at the scale, the depth of the horror, you have to ask yourself, was, this, was it necessary to go this far? If there's something that we were supposed to learn by some karmic reaction, why did it have to be so dramatic? I, when, I, when I teach Holocaust before university classes, I like to begin with a practical example because most students have no idea what, what they're 
getting into when they talk about the Holocaust or sign up for a course. So I use sometimes an example from the Buchenwald Report, which was a collection of um, first-person accounts of survivors of concentration camp Buchenwald. And there was one woman who described that um, when she was being rounded up by the Nazis to be deported to Buchenwald, she had a small child, a baby, and uh, infants were not allowed in the camps. So the guards, the Nazi guards who stormed into her apartment to uh, deport her to Buchenwald, uh, looked at her as she was holding her baby and said, give, give me that baby. And the mother refused. So the guard took the baby out of the mother's arms and ripped it in half in front of the mother's eyes. Now, how do we incorporate that kind of horror into a vision of a universe that was created by God for the well-being of his children? How, how do we explain, uh, how do we incorporate that? Well, we can't. We, we actually can't, uh, other than with some uh, rather insensitive and uh, superficial well, that child obviously did something in a previous life that uh, that child deserved uh, such horror. And, and the mother also, I suppose, the mother also must have done something terrible because to witness your child being destroyed in such a horrible manner. Um, so the, the question arises, why so much pain and suffering? Um, there, there's a book by... Um, a rabbi, uh, Harold Kirchner, oh, yes, called Bad yeah. Things Happen to Good People. Yes. Uh, Kirchner was um, brought up to believe, as a God-fearing person, that um, if you live your life in a particular way, if you follow the rules, follow the regular principles, chant your 16 rounds, that God will reciprocate. Mm. Uh, he and his wife, however, had the rather tragic experience of having a child who was um, um, uh, infected with a disease called um, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the name. It's rapid aging. Something. And um, yeah. Something, etheria. I don't remember the full name. They watched their child die of old age by the time he reached 12 years. He literally became shrunken and wizened like an old person with um, uh, wrinkled skin and, and so on, and died of old age. Progeria. Progeria, Progeria is the word. Progeria. Um, Kushner had to revise his whole thinking about God. He had to revised his entire impression of his studies of the Bible. Mm. Why do these things happen? I've lived my life so carefully and so on. So he came to this conclusion in what we were describing before of um, uh, um, um, theodicy, that God is all good, but he could not be all powerful. He could not tolerate the idea that God is not all good. So we concluded that we have to carve out some place in creation for evil, that evil has a role to play in the universe, and God does not control that side of things. Mm. Well, of course, that's not our Vaishnav Siddhanta. We have a different perspective. But I do believe that it's critical for devotees, if they're going to make serious progress in their Krishna consciousness, to go beyond the basics. The basics, of course, have to be there. You know, prashadam and deity worship, and you know, these are the foundations of our spiritual life. But if all that we do is follow the basics, then we're missing out on the greater dimension of the mission that we've been called upon to uh, participate in. Um, if Srila Prabhupada came to the West at such great sacrifice and personal suffering, and um, it was 
and not to just follow the basics. If, if, if what he wanted to do was just the basics, he could have stayed back in Vrindavan. He had no reason to come to the West, except that his spiritual master had said, you please take this risk for Krishna. Step outside the predictable. Step outside the basics. Go and do something extraordinary. Now, we may not be called upon to do that you, kind of stuff. Yeah. When you're using the word basics, you're talking about the standard practices and the standard philosophy of Krishna consciousness. That is, that we often speak in our temple, temple outreach programs. That's right. But you, like a, I'm saying, you're going beyond basics means like a broader engagement with uh, the issues of the issue, uh, issues that occupy, say, mainstream society or mainstream intellect. You don't challenge us. That's right. You don't challenge yourself to go deeper into the foundations of our the Vaishnav uh, philosophy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then, then <clears throat> first of all, you're going to miss out. You're going to miss out on something breathtaking and absolutely inspiring. Because if, if you go inside these topics, I, here's the thing. Because I, I ask myself often, why, why, are there not enough, why are there not more in-depth discussions about these issues? You know, I mean, we hear all kinds of, I mean, there's wonderful progress being made. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm, I'm not uh, criticizing what, what's happening in Srila Prabhupada's movement today. There's some amazing things happening. But I, I do ask myself why there isn't more of a willingness to confront these kinds of issues. I mean, I, that's why I appreciate you so much. You have no hesitation, you know, stepping outside your comfort zone and, and getting into issues that really challenge why are you involved in Krishna consciousness? How do you reconcile for yourself these disparities? How do you justify for yourself the difference between this idealistic, beautiful view and, and the realities of the world we live in? And I think, I think we're missing out if we don't embrace that challenge. And if we, if we fall too deeply into a comfortable routine of Krishna consciousness, and, and we don't continue to challenge ourselves, I think we're going to miss out. And we, we're, we're not going to make progress and spiritual advancement as quickly. Mm. Yes, true. I think we have discussed this in our earlier sessions also about how to actually engage with contemporary issues. We need to study those issues deeply. and need to also study our philosophy deeply. Then we can engage. Yeah. So sure. now look, that's what attracted me to Krishna consciousness. I was not a religious. I, I don't even think today I'm a religious person. Quite honestly, I'm not. I'm not very big on on ritual. I'm not very big on you know the Lord says. And I'm I'm not a particularly religious person. I'm I'm surrendered body and soul to my spiritual master Srila Prabhupada. Mm. And, and Krishna fascinates me. But the notion of an institutional God, I find troubling. So I, there is a distinction to be made here, I think. Some, Krishna says in the Gita, some people just want me as their God. All right, that's fine. <laughs> but there's this other category. You know, go deeper inside the understanding of his, of his true nature. When I encountered Krishna consciousness, it was this thrilling mixture of these things. You know, there was this, Fan, uh, it was a combination of the fantastic, this amazing vision of spiritual realms and, and, and the deeper dimensions of reality, and this highly credible narrative you know, of souls in search of their true love, you know, souls emerging from a condition uh, of, of material repeated birth and death. So if you settle too deeply into that empiric mindset of, you know, this is the, the, what I see is the reality, uh, it can lead to some very dark places. We can stagnate. And, and I think we have to challenge one another. Why is it that Krishna made things so difficult? Why is it necessary for there to be such pain and suffering on such a scale? If there is something to be learned, can't we learn it without having to see children um, die uh, uh, of addiction to uh, 
uh, um, uh, amphetamines and, and, and crack because their parents were addicted? Is it necessary to see people suffer on such a scale? Why, why the depth of the horror? What, what's the point there? How does that reflect a, a, a loving, compassionate supreme being? Right? This is why people turn away from Krishna consciousness. People don't turn away from Krishna consciousness because they don't like our style of dress or because they don't like our music or they don't like our prasadam. They turn away because it philosophically it makes no sense to them. Logically, it makes no sense. Why does your Krishna allow the Holocaust? That's a serious question for a lot of people. And I don't think we, we, we study those questions deeply enough to have a position that people would find acceptable. So here, I mean, I appreciate this point. So if we take this discussion forward, is there a difference between a general a theistic, uh, that this being a ta challenge to theism and the existence of God itself, and that is definitely there. But to the discussion of, uh, of uh, theodicy, are we trying to add something distinctive from the Krishna conscious perspective? Or are we um, addressing the problem of evil, uh, more or less, on the same terms that that uh, say other I mean, Christianity, I think, has had the maximum engagement and Judaism also. Uh, the problem of evil itself doesn't seem to have occupied Hindu thought so much. That means it has been more of how this world itself is a place of distress, and we need to liberate ourselves from the world. The specifics of the kinds of distresses, they don't seem to have occupied the, the Indian mind so much. Uh, is this, is your reading of scripture also similar or you would like to differ on this? No, I mean, look, I, I, I think what you're describing uh, to some extent is a, a, um, an after effect from the teachings of Shankara, the uh, Advaita Vedanta school that um, the body is something to get out of, the material world is something to get out of. Uh, um, Shankara described the material world as, as a treacherous ocean filled with uh, uh, deadly creatures, deadly monsters, <laughs> sea creatures, mm -hmm. and your job is to get out of it. You know, why bother um, trying to remedy a situation when your goal is to, uh, to negate it, to get out of it? You know, Prabhupada described it as being like, you know, why, why um, decorate your prison cell? You know, get out of prison. Um, so in, in some, in the, and there are scholars like David Haberman and, and others who have drawn a, a connection between, for example, the um, abuse of the environment in India with Shankarite Advaita Vedanta. Yes. Why, why bother cleaning up the world? We, we, the world is illusion. <laughs> it's not real. Why bother cleaning up a dream? Why bother getting involved deeper with something that, that uh, it, it is a lie? It's an illusion. Yes, okay. So, of course, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu thought otherwise. Our, our philosophy is different. We don't say that the world is illusion. We say the world is illusory. Yeah. It's different. The world is real but it's a temporary reality. And we don't reject it. It's what Rupa Goswami called yukta vairagya. What we reject is the mentality of proprietorship. Mm. We don't own this world. We feel a sense of stewardship for the world. So there's a big difference. And that's the mission that we're called upon to preserve, perpetuate, uh, in, in, in the modern society. But to do that, we, we can't avoid these hard issues. Yes. You know? Look, Just one minute. Think, think about that. Before you yeah. go to the next. So, you know, I've also repeatedly seen this, like I read Heberman's book uh, and his thesis, basically his thesis. So there is, if I may play the devil's advocate here, 
there is a tendency within vaishnav circles to to make advaitavad the whipping boy for everything that is bad in hinduism and if we consider today's world uh, many of the advaitic organizations are involved in a lot of humanitarian work sometimes more oh, oh yes more than vaishnavas also they are also working there with the baptist Look at the Swami Narayan group. They do such amazing social activity. Incredible. They show up without without even asking. They'll start serving. They'll start helping with something. It's wonderful. So even 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 from an environmental perspective, it's not that say our Vaishnavism has necessarily made us more environmentally conscious than uh, than say other branches of Hinduism. Even if so, the how much that philosophy. has actually affected people's way of living and thinking and because if you talk about the world being like a treacherous ocean that idea is there in the bhagavatam also where the forest of material enjoyment where there are so it's not only shankara's philosophy it is there in the bhagavatam oh. it is there in the bhagavatam also although we could say that, that is a that is we could say uh, an ex, an, um, somewhat of a extreme example because parikshit maharaj is about to die and the focus is on just transcending the world at that time but uh, overall uh, so my my question was that can we really uh, place that uh, that apathy towards the world sufferings uh, place the blame for that on advaitavad alone no <laughs> that's a That, that's taking uh, the idea of a loaded question to a whole new level. Of course not. Of course, of course we're not going. To And I was giving it. I was trying to respond. You know, you were asking me about conditions in India, and, and, and yeah, okay. why that's the case. So I was trying to respond to you. Um, if there's a, if if there's a shortcoming in the social work of organizations that do not have the blessing of the insight we have been offered into the nature of the supreme person and the relationship of the soul with the supreme person through bhakti um it's that the work is not fully complete in terms of its spiritual value and if there's a shortcoming in terms of what the devotees may be doing it's very often that um we're unable to appreciate the value of what others do i think sometimes we have these blinders on you it's our way or the highway and um and that's wrong that's of course that's wrong that it, it's understood that there's a a more informed way of seeing the cause behind things some of it is very uh, systemic mm. yeah, i i, I want to bring this back though cuz you you're touching on something that's critically important if we're going to discuss the connection between uh, the holocaust and and krishna consciousness yes so um, if you if you go back to the national socialist era the ideas of the nazi party were founded on very biological definitions of life you know the darwinian uh view of uh survival of the fittest for example Hitler's policy was that's all there is is survival of the fittest and everything else is nothing but a Jewish construct whether it's compassion or humanity humanitarianism or whether it's the nobility of the human spirit or the uh <clears throat> vision of a benign and beneficent supreme being um that was all uh, Jewish uh formalism and it was an infection it's all lies all the and 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 you german people you have to help us nazi party eliminate these lies by eliminating the jews life is nothing but survival of the fittest and that means that these chemicals are more fit to survive than those chemicals <clears throat> this community of people these are aryans Hitler borrowed the word from the Sanskrit. Yeah, of course. Aryan in the Nazi perspective meant the um German 
high lineage, you know, pure blood Germans. Right? That's nothing to do. The word Aryan means one who knows the higher value of life. It doesn't mean your, your, your blood is pure German, right? That's okay, true. but that's how he misapplied that term. So that dominant perspective on the meaning of life, there was no room there for souls, for God, for some higher purpose in life. There was only survival of the fittest. And so if we're looking to see how does Krishna consciousness comment on <clears throat> totalitarianism, what is the relationship between the Vedic perspective and the, the greatest tragedies of human history? How do these two things comment on each other? It would be that we have this other dimension. You know, in, in those lectures that I'm asked to give, people always say, how could, they, if you're such a spiritual person, how, how do you rationalize what happened in, in Europe 80 years ago? And it's, you know, it's, it's unfair to ask <laughs> such a complicated question when you only have a few seconds to reply. But I've come up with what I think is a, a, a good way of getting out of it. And I'll say that when we, when we turn away from our true nature as divine beings, as spiritual beings, sparks of God, then we can fall very, very, very far away. And we become capable of unspeakable horrors. When we turn toward our true nature, we can soar very, very high. And people seem to appreciate that as a kind of general general answer. That's beautiful. So is this the same twisting, you know, of the evolutionary idea for political purposes? Yeah. So just going back to that earlier point, when I, I also read a little bit about uh, the Holocaust, so I, I read this book from Darwin to Hitler. So it seems to be a very well-researched book about the similarities between the Nazi ideology and the ideas of evolution, but then it is also quite seriously panned by critics because they say that there was Hitler also at times uh, claimed to be blessed by God or claimed to be doing the will of God. And uh, so was it because atheists often try to uh, avoid taking uh, they say blame for the the disasters that have happened in the last century, and we cannot really simply blame atheism alone because there's a lot of ideologies going on over there. So you said two things. One is that within the within the Darwinian worldview or within the Nazi worldview, there is no room for God or soul, and on the, in contrast, in the Vaishnava worldview, you could say if that worldview is accepted, the human spirit can rise high and go beyond the beyond we could say at least reduce the possibility of doing uh, of succumbing to such uh, such depravities and on the positive side it can do actually a lot of good did i understand you right in what i'm rephrasing well it, it, it's a it's, it's a good summary but of course there are a lot of um, loose threads there first of all hitler would have, so far as hitler uh, having been you know blessed by god Hitler would say anything <laughs> to get what he wanted. He had, he had no qualms lying through his teeth every single day of his life. Um, you know, look at the Ribbentrop Pact with Russia. I mean, uh, yes, we'll agree to share the hegemony over Poland, and boom, the next day goes to work. Um, so that that's not an issue. Um, they... You may have to rephrase your question. There was a lot there. Could you uh, no, so give I'm, me a summary of Yeah, so, okay. I was simply trying to uh, point out that if you, want a uh, if you want to address, as you said, with spiritual wisdom, the question of the Holocaust. So were you trying to draw a contrast that in a worldview where there is, that there has no place for God or soul, such depravities are, are likely and in a worldview where there is 
there is a potential for spiritual growth and divine love such depravity the soul will soar higher and then these kind of depravities are less likely or i i didn't well, really understand yeah. how you were addressing uh, well yeah remember i qualified that answer by saying that was my way of getting out of a very complex question when there was only a minute or two to answer it no of course not more depravity has been perpetrated in the name of religion than in the name of anything else um, people will twist and distort the notion of um, God is on our side. They'll weaponize religion uh, at, at the drop of a hat. Mm. So we, we have to be very careful when we, when we talk about these things. The, the, the universe is not so neatly divided you know, into believers and non-believers, into right and wrong, good and bad. You know, there are shades of gray. There are multi-multi-dimensions to the reality of things. I mean, generally what we can say is that the Nazis sought to weaponize Darwinian theory, you know, by using it to confirm, you know, the, the, the statement of Pythagoras that your know, man is the measure of all things, that humans rule by natural right, you know, is the apex of evolution, you know, so therefore uh, what, what, so, and what's critically important of, about Krishna consciousness is it adds a missing narrative. It fills in a dimension that, that's uh, ignored by people who would use um, religion or evolution or whatever for their own political purposes. It, it, this is interesting. My experience being with Srila Prabhupada, I'm going to say something that gets me into a lot of trouble, but I'm going to say it anyway. My experience being with Srila Prabhupada, he very rarely said um, they're completely and utterly wrong. He, very, he didn't say that too often. More often what he would say is they're not wrong, their, their explanation is incomplete. By there, I, I remember uh, uh, by there, well, have... I'll give you an example. I remember. Yeah, please. Let me give you an example. Yes, please. Uh, we were in Paris, and uh, there was a, a senior devotee who was in charge of Europe at the time. And he was describing a um, uh, meeting with some religionists from the French church. And um, <clears throat> his point was, so uh, they have no idea of God. They have it all wrong. And Prabhupada's response to not wrong, incomplete. Yeah. So Prabhupada responded to what we presented to him. And unfortunately, we did not always present things to him in such a way that he had a, 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 an objective overview of whatever the subject might be. He was responding to how we presented it to him. Mm. So if we were talking about evolution, usually we gave an oversimplified idea of evolution, which was frankly wrong. Darwin himself admitted that this is just a theory, you know, of, of adaptation, you know, that, that species under certain conditions will adapt to their environment. And he said, I could be wrong about it, but that's my observation. You know? He didn't draw these grand conclusions that when we were presenting uh, evolution to Prabhupada, we oversimplified. So he was responding to our oversimplification. Mm. And he would say, kick on their face, so whatever, from time to time. That's very different from a reasoned, in-depth study and analysis, a careful unpacking of the components of an idea. I think we, we, we really have to be very careful about that. I, I don't go on, on Facebook. I, I find it a waste of time. But I do hear about a lot of the discussions that take place. And I think it's absolutely tragic. People get involved in conversations about, you know, flat earth, round earth, you know, go to the moon, not go to the moon, evolution, not evolution. They don't know what they're talking about. They have such a poor fund of, uh, of understanding. They've never studied these things. They've never read the books. They have no idea what Prabhupada's true position on things were. They, they you know they're drawing these naive and frankly dangerous conclusions. And it can lead to horrible outcomes. I mean, that, you know, Hitler's understanding 
of Darwinian evolution was was pathetic. He had, he was not a scholar of of he was not a paleontologist or, or a biologist or an anthropologist. He had no idea of, of of the history of 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 nature, none whatsoever. He took whatever he could and he propagandized it. He weaponized it for his purpose. We have to be very careful that we don't fall into that same. Hmm. True. And and that's true. For example, as we were discussing, someone says, "Well, the Holocaust people get what they they deserve." What a tragic, inhuman oversimplification of something that's terribly complicated. Terribly complicated. You know, and and uh, I think we really need to be cautious about this. But to my mind, that's what it means to be a devotee. It means to strive to go deeper inside these subjects and to at least have the humility to say, you know, I don't really understand this. Let me talk with someone who has a deeper uh, education in these subjects so that I can come to an informed decision. Yeah. That's why I got involved in Holocaust documentaries and, and books and research, because I was tired of people saying to me, how do you reconcile the Holocaust with your belief in Krishna and not really having a very good answer to give them? That's why I've continued in, the, in this track. I think I've come a little bit closer to an understanding of, of what's going on. Yeah, I'm, I'm not King Solomon. I don't have the answers to everything. Hmm. Yes, Guru. So please, I mean, as, as a message to your podcast viewers, please be very careful before you come to some conclusion or, or position on an issue. Make sure you understand the background to that issue. You know, I'm, I'm involved with something else right now. It's a code of ethical behavior for, for ISKCON. And I'm running into all kinds of problems because there, there's this uh, tendency to want to accommodate many different perspectives you know, on what is ethical, what is not ethical. I, I don't want to get into the details, but it's, it gets very discouraging that, that, that we seem to have this very um, naive approach that um, <clears throat> we have to accommodate uh, all, all points of view, and therefore we can take an idea whether it's ethical behavior or what our position is on, on any complex subject and give it some simplistic treatment. Very disheartening sometimes i understand yes so you know, i i really appreciate the depth of compassion and concern from which you are speaking right now and uh, i also seen you know, one of the most glaring examples i had you know in india there was in 2000 uh, in about seven eight years ago there was a very brutal gang rape of a girl that had happened in Delhi. And then after that, there was some, some speaker who gave a class saying that uh, it was uh, that person's karma. So. The woman, yeah, I read about that. that yeah. It's her fault. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing to say it's her fault. That's like victim blaming, but that's more like a social, okay, maybe she was careless, she was too forward or whatever. But it's taking it to another level to say it was her own karma. Mm. So it was. So that was the time when I thought this just doesn't work. And then that's the time I also started exploring. Not only it doesn't work in terms of it, you know, it's not going to. It's going to alienate people. It also doesn't work in. It. It's not a compassionate response at all. It's not a. It's not a, a response that reflects the compassionate depth of the tradition that we are supposed to represent. So I, I fully appreciate, I mean, I, I can't say I fully appreciate, but I do appreciate where you're coming from. And um, so taking this forward, you said that if you, in a minute or two, if you had to answer, you talk about this, you know, the soul, the soul spirit can soar higher. Uh, if you want to, do you have a, as you said, you have studied this deeper. Do you have a, more detailed answer that you would like to go into or you would like to focus on this principle that we shouldn't that these are difficult questions and we shouldn't uh, uh, we shouldn't give oversimplified 
and even distorted answers to complicated questions. Uh, you're asking a good question, and I'm not sure I have a, an immediate answer for you. Okay. Um, the reason is, okay. the reason is, I I wish to also recognize my own limitations. I I'm not a GBC. I don't have to run an international society. Mm. I don't have to deal with countries mm. where uh, homosexuality is outlawed. You know, I don't have to deal with, um, you know, how do you um, uh, adjust Krishna consciousness for cultures where the values are different from our own, you know. All I know is my own <laughs> admittedly biased perspective. You know, I was born in a family, we didn't have much money. I grew up just with my mother, but she always made sure that I had a good education. And the education I had was a, 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 a liberal, intellectual, um, humanistic, ethical culture education, um, which seeks to strive for a better world through uh, a compassionate view of how we behave toward one another. Um, and I admit that uh, I'm prejudiced. I'm biased by being white, by being male, by having my health, by not having to con confront the, uh, the challenges that um, people in the LGBTQ community have to confront, people who, are, uh, who have uh, physical or mental uh, handicaps, or people who uh, are living in dire poverty. I don't know their experiences. So it's hard for me. No, it's no, it's easy for me. <laughs> it's easy for me to pontificate and, and speak about uh, you know noble ideals and, and so on. Um, so there's a lot that I don't know, and, and I have to be cautious about imposing. I mean, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna describes the risks of the mode of goodness. You know, my my conceit is thinking that I, I, I'm, I'm mostly in the mode of goodness, right? So in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna describes the, the, the danger of the mode of goodness is thinking that you're, you know, and other people don't, <laughs> that you're informed, you have knowledge, and other people don't have that knowledge. So there's a kind of egotism that comes with being a good person, right? So uh, I know that that gets in the way sometimes. Uh, that's why I'd, I'd make a very, very bad administrator. I'm, I'm, I'm too sensitive to the feelings of the other person. Uh, I, I think to be a good administrator, sometimes you've got to be a little cold-blooded in order to make decisions that are, de that are either beneficial in the long term or for a greater number of people or whatever. I don't have those skills. I don't have that ability. What I can do, however, is reflect back to others as an educator those lessons that I have learned and believe that I understand. I believe that to embrace Krishna consciousness on a superficial level is as dangerous, if not more dangerous, than being an atheist. Mm. I believe that someone who has simply, out of sadness over their past life or whatever, substituted a life of you know, Kuntimala and, and, and Kirtan and, and, and uh, festivals without going deep into what this means to be a devotee are in a risky position and those people can do damage to Srila Prabhupada's mission. These are my observations. Whether I, I don't claim that they're universal, I don't claim that they're true for everybody, but I've, this is what I have seen. That in the name of Krishna consciousness, much harm can be done, just as in the name of, of the interest of the German people, so much harm was done. Because an idea can be twisted so easily, so easily. Do you think for one moment that because we have this image of Krishna in Vrindavan, and we have the teachings of Bhagavad Gita, therefore all of our decisions are wise? 
all of our des- our decisions are correct. How 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 egotistical. We're we're still conditioned souls here. You know, and, and we we have to be very, very careful about what we think we know. That I, I don't know if that's of any use <laughs> to your viewers, no, to no. your community of, of no. I, I have no idea, but uh, no, I it's my observation. Yes. After five years in Krishna consciousness. Yeah, yeah that's true. Cool. No, it's just, there's no. always this challenge of, of uh, say, operating an institution and the real world constraints that it places. Uh, and there is also the tendency to sometimes uh, weaponize ideology for the sake of uh, what one feels is expedient. So that is something which we have to guard against. At the, that is, I would say those who are the managers have to guard against. At the same time, you know, those who are more of educators or intellectuals, you know, there is the tendency to claim that we know everything. And if people would just listen to us, things would be better. But I think the way you presented it is a balance. That you know, these are difficult issues, and we are also all trying to learn some things. And what we present, or if we really go deeper into subjects and understand those subjects, then at least a resource will be available for the devotee community and the devote and the leaders of that devotee community for tackling those issues. It's, so I think this is a very, it's, a, it's, it's profoundly humble. At the same time, it's, 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 a, deeply, a, de- it's a deeply wise and realized uh, take on things. So Prabhu, just one, one or two. OK, you wanted to say something? No, please continue. So you know, there is one perspective we talked about is the, the problem of evil from the theodicy perspective that um, how could God allow it? But another perspective is we talked about human nature. So how could human beings do something like this? So the two are related, but still uh, the two are somewhat distinct questions. So in our tradition, we have the idea of uh, divine and demoniac natures. And if you consider the 16th chapter, in the demoniac nature, Krishna does talk about how peop- some people delight in causing harm and causing death. They celebrate it. They just see how powerful I am, how unrivaled my power is. So uh, now that doesn't really talk about mass destruction, but I think in one of the purports, 16.9 Prabhupada says that this verse indirectly talks about weapons of mass destruction. So when we talk about this divine and demoniac nature, uh, do we see these as uh, two, two polarities within human nature itself? So, because at one level we could say there is a divine and demoniac side within everyone. And in some cases, the demoniac side is very highly developed. So, would you like to address this issue briefly from this perspective, the divine and demoniac natures? So now we're going to hour two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, there, there, there is no polarity in the nature of the soul. Mm. There, there is no divine and demonic na- nature in, in, in the eternal Atma. The Jivatma is pure spirit and it, it, it is Satchitananda. Uh, so we are talking about the soul in its embodied state, in its conditioned state. Mm. You know, they, they, the nitya badha souls. Mm. So yes, the, the longer we're in the material world, the more we're exposed to matter, the more our original nature gets covered more and more and more and more to the point where it may seem to be extinguished. People may be behaving in such a way that you can say they have no spiritual nature. <laughs> These people are just pure evil. Um, uh, we we are compelled by our faith to know that however evil someone may be, that there there's an original nature there. 
the great souls, the great, great souls. Mm -hmm. I don't mean ordinary great souls. <laughs> you know, you and I know a lot of God brothers and God sisters who are great souls, but I'm talking now about great souls, capital G, capital S. Right? Yes. The truly great souls. They can enter into a situation of pure evil and turn that situation around without saying a word just by their presence. It's possible. Look at uh, Jagai and Madai, for example. Pure evil. Pure evil. Can you imagine uh, throwing a sharp object at Nityananda Prabhu? I mean, <laughs> and, and the, the, the harm they did. The, there, was, there was nothing redemptive in their characters. Chaitanya hmm. Mahaprabhu by his, by his presence. Not only did he get them to apologize and reform, they became exalted Vaishnavas. <laughs> they, they built bathing ghats. You know, they, they gave their lives over to devotional service. The, 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 the conversion there, the, that, not conversion, the reversion to their original spiritual nature was so complete. It was possible because of Chaitanya's presence, just as mere presence. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada could do that as well. So if we become qualified, sufficiently qualified, Hmm. It's possible. Now, without mentioning names, there were some disciples of Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Goswami Maharaj who actually met Hitler. They went to Germany in the 1930s and they had audience with Hitler. They didn't change him this much. Not this much. That's true. Srila Prabhupada came and he, he changed the entire Western world. You know, he, this 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 lecha dom here in <laughs> this this world of hitlers this world of, of of fallen souls by his presence by his purity mm -hmm. so that's that's where we're going that that's where we're supposed to go is to that place where we're so self-aware and we're so krishna conscious that uh we can go even into that most darkest of evil and become agents of change but don't fake that. Don't pretend that. Don't attempt to do that <laughs> if you're not a great soul because you'll do more harm than good. You will probably kill yourself in the process and you will just make things worse. So we have to be honest. You want to uh, bring peace to an area of war. You want to bring harmony to a place of strife and conflict. You better be pretty well situated in your Krishna consciousness. Yes. So I think that is a important point that you know. That means wherever we are, according to our adhikar, according to our level, we can share Krishna consciousness, and then at least there we bring about some virtue, some spirituality, and uh, those who are far greater than us, they can maybe work at places where there is there is far greater evil but we could say evil is in degrees and if we combat the evil in our hearts then we are also playing a small part at least in decreasing the overall evil in the world now what you've just done there Chaitanya Chan Prabhu is to put your finger on the position that I'm trying to communicate to people with regard to this code of ethical behavior we have to set a norm, a standard, no matter what the external, social, or cultural, or historic, or political conditions may be. My conviction is that Srila Prabhupada would have preferred to have a smaller movement that is of the very highest standard than a big, powerful, wealthy, international institution that's constantly making compromises and bowing to the money people and come and 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 uh, uh, um, abrogating uh, the standards because in this place uh, that's not the the culture. That that's my position. That he wanted one moon, not a sky full of stars. I, you know, I so, I have my own experiences with him where I I tried to compromise. He didn't like it. He didn't like it at all. He said, "We will stand on our purity." So if I it's a big challenge, huge, huge challenge. 
Yeah. Now, if I understand right, when you are talking about one moon that we have written thousand stars, what you are referring to is, uh, is I would say very different from the way I have heard this verse being used. And that means I, I have often heard this verse being used that we should be completely uncompromising in presenting our philosophy, however hard it hits people and we shouldn't worry about people's feelings. And even if, if through our hard preaching only one person comes, that's, that's, that's the glory. So I think what you are talking about is more of uh, say those who would prefer to cut cut some ethical corners in the name of practicality to get big things. Let's let, let's be honest here. Let's be honest. I don't think there are five people who came to Krishna consciousness because they were so impressed that Prabhupada was a lion and he came down like a like an avalanche of stones uh, on, on people and and uh, was a uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, strict and, and an authoritarian. People don't even know the philosophy he was teaching. They came because they were attracted to him. They, they came because they were appreciative of his Vaishnava character. We talked about this when we had our discussion about science also. Yeah. You can have all the mathematical formulas in the world. You're not going to do one bit of good to improve people's lives. Go deep into your heart. develop some appreciation and compassion that everyone out there is like you, an eternal soul caught up in this material world. That compassion, that will attract people. Not imitating, you know, the lion guru. Who are you, you little ant, you little nothing, that you're going to become a lion guru? What, what foolishness. It's crazy. You know, Iron fist, you know. <laughs> when, when has that ever been effective? No, he could be strict. He would come down heavy on people who were representing truth and had no idea what they were saying. But those moments were rare. He, he, it, it, he would. He, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was not about Aishwarya. He was about Madhurya. Our movement is not about, you know, the all-powerful supreme being. It's about the, the love of the residents of Vrindavan. So, I, anyway, it's a deep subject, and I apologize if I'm going on a little bit too long with it. No, no, no. But, um, Beautiful. I never really correlated till now I, the, about the Aishwarya and the Madhurya, that, that the, say, the Guru's... Uh, Guru's heaviness and the Guru's loving nature, you can also connect it with the idea of God's cosmic greatness and God's sweetness as is related in Vrindavan. And, and that's a very striking statement. You said that not even five people might have come because of Prabhupada's being like a lion guru. That could be. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you devoted? My spiritual master came down like a ton of bricks on people's heads and smashed them. I, I don't hear people talking about that step of why they became devotee. You know, um, I, I've had occasion to work with a, a wildlife preserve in North Carolina called the Tigers Preserve. And uh, when you observe lions, the lion most of the time is a very tranquil animal just sitting peacefully, observing what's going on. The lion doesn't have to prove its strength by going out and ripping everybody to shreds. The only time an, a lion will attack is when it needs food. Other than that, it's quite tranquil and peaceful. People who are really strong don't have to prove their strength to anybody. They keep that in reserve for those rare moments when it's needed. Real strength is self-control, not lack of self-control. That's heavy. It's so true also. So Prabhu, then can you maybe articulate in your words when you said 
we should focus on one moon and not many stars what did you have it in mind what when you said that um, <laughs> probably of course was somebody for everything he wanted a worldwide movement that was his spiritual master's request but uh, he wanted quality also not just quantity he wanted quality and i think he understood that everybody will will make it you know he he gave initiation freely it was an emergency measure to just build that foundation of his movement but he wanted people to take it seriously and go deep inside the philosophy and uh, understand you talk about something like the holocaust it doesn't come up that often in classes it's too profound a subject it's too complicated a subject but probably wanted us to go deep inside the issues of our world so that we can make a contribution so we, we, it's, it's a big challenge it's a very very big thing here and not to be taken lightly mm. i i i know many look i i turned 70 two months ago right so i've been in krishna consciousness a long time and i've met a lot of people there's such wonderful people <laughs> uh, 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 all I want is uh, the association of the Lord's devotees, birth after birth after birth. <laughs> that was Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's prayer. Devotees are the most wonderful people in the world. Uh, but because we're an international organization, it, it takes all kinds to make a movement. And uh, we've had to spend a lot of time repairing mistakes from the past and just maintaining a temple is such hard work, you know. So we don't, we don't always have the luxury of sitting around and discussing deep issues like this. But I hope that in the very near future, that will change and that we will continue to grow as uh, Shunak Rishi is doing with the Oxford Center or as uh, they're doing with uh, Bhaktivedanta College or uh, the Bhaktivedanta Institute in Alachua. Mm. There are pockets where people are going deeper now inside the meaning of Krishna consciousness and its application in the world. That's to be encouraged. That's, that's critically important. Mm. Yes, so that's true. So it's intellectual think tanks, to some extent, in the first generation, we didn't really spend much energy on that. Now, slowly, something is happening. And little, little, like, little by little. Yeah. Mm. So, but so I, that's why I'm so thankful to you that you take topics. I mean, your, your podcasts are vitally important. You invite people who have expertise in particular areas and you invite them to go deeper into their, their subject, their field. And uh, that's a, a very important contribution. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. Yes, for what I'm, you're doing. I'm, it is my fortune I get to have the association of very learned and mature devotees to this. And also, I feel that uh, you know, we need to create a space for thoughtful moderates. I would say that if I, not that these words, polit moderates, liberals, conservatives, they all have their political, their politically charged terms. But what I would mean is that just a place for balanced, thoughtful discussions where we don't, we don't claim to know the answers and give the answers, but rather we candidly discuss. Uh, so I often, when I, I take any issue with anyone in the podcast, my, our mood is not that we will give the answers, but at least we'll give you, we will try to provide some framework for thinking deeply about issues. So it's not so much about the Bhagavad Gita also is not so much about giving an answer to Arjuna's question, whether I should fight or not. Krishna could have just given one word answer fight. But Krishna actually gives him resources for thinking deeply. And then Arjuna arrives at his own informed decision. That's what I'm trying to do here. And I'm grateful that you are regularly sparing your time and sharing your wisdom. This is a this is a not only a difficult subject to discuss, but from what I was observing you, I think this is a difficult subject for you personally also. Because you probably no, I know the gravity from what I have read about the Holocaust. 
but for you it because you have studied it more it must be much more personal so thank you for taking this challenging subject and discussing it in significant detail hey krishna so should i quickly try to summarize for you or you want to add something in concluding words no i always look forward to your summaries yeah it's a uh, i try <laughs> oh so today we discuss on the topic of the holocaust uh, human nature and say spiritual wisdom so we started by talking about how the how you got involved in holocaust studies and how when the question comes up the major question it brings is how could a all loving god allow this to happen and even there's something to learn so why so much suffering so then in response to my question why the holocaust is so prominent because of the as a symbol of human depravity it is because of it was it was state sponsored it was so systematic and it was so scientifically executed so it depicted human human depravity in a in a way that has few parallels in human recent human memory and then you discussed about i think two three different perspectives one is that <clears throat> that the the human spirit is uh, when there is a world view that provides no room for god or soul or anything higher in life then then humanity can go down to a uh, shocking depravity that is one side which we say say the the holocaust depicts on the other side if we have a spiritually informed and spiritually empowering world view and the soul can soar high and do a lot of good in, instead of becoming a becoming a becoming depraved and then i think the most important point we discussed was that uh, uh that you know these are very difficult issues and over simplified uh representations of philosophy can actually be viol be viol be violent and alienating so just as it is a very provocatively precise example i would say just as hitler might miss you he knew nothing about evolution but he just used evolution to justify his agenda so similarly as devotees we might use the karma philosophy to say that people are simply getting what they deserve So which is uh, is uncompassionate which is unhelpful and uh, it can be alienating and then you talk about your prabhupad wanted us to deep engage deeply with issues and not just stick to the basics of basics are important but apart from directly telling about our practices and principles we engage with the issues that are there in modern society in contemporary society and and present spiritual wisdom in a way that addresses those issues and then we discussed about you know, the constraints that come because of a, operating an institution and uh, within that how the intellectuals can become like a resource so that we don't just in the name of institutional constraints become become we just put ethics on the side and do whatever we feel is necessary and then there is a significant discussion about how prabhupad's that prabhupad's uh, heavy speaking was not really what attracted people uh, that it was one part of what attracted him but it was his loving nature his compassion his saintly qualities and that example of lion was striking that a lion doesn't it doesn't have to prove its strength so we don't have to really even if somebody is as exalted as a simha as a lion guru they don't have to go about go about proving themselves to others and uh, proving them over to others so so becoming one moon and not having preferring one moon instead of a thousand stars what that one moon is not just the strictness with which we practice or the forcefulness with which we present a message but it also means that we go deep in and we realize krishna and then we try to present krishna in a way that uplifts others so lastly i think the virtue part was that that while 
the great Vaishnavas can go even into ghastly situations and transform hearts like Nityan Prabhu did with Jagai and Madai, who were pure evil. But we can at least, you know, be virtuous in our particular life and our social circles. And in that way, we can play our role in combating vice and evil in the world. So any other points you I missed out or you'd like to add as a conclusion, Prabhu? It's a sobering and uplifting discussion. No, I'm just always, I'm just always amazed at how how you're able to take an hour and a half conversation and from memory distill down the main beats of the talk into just a few moments. It's uh, it's very impressive, and um, no, bro, it's, it's one of the reasons why I love coming back to talk with you. No, sure. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so for your much. kind words. Thank you. And it's been a it's been a very important discussion, I feel. And I look forward to having your association again in future also. Thank you very much. Humble obeisance. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you.